Welcome to On the Record, stories of strength and survival with our host, Linda Crockett from the Canadian Institute of Workplace Harassment and Violence, providing services to clients with dignity, inclusion, and integrity using evidence-based practices and approaches with openness and transparency. Sponsored by Global Sway. And today we are having our seventh episode of On the Record. Our topic today is academic bullying, a very important topic, and we have four amazing guests that are going to share the facts, the stories, and resources available to you. We know that students around the world are asking questions, seeking answers and direction and guidance, and that a great deal of change needs to happen. I think that can be information you're going to gain from this episode today, so please stay tuned. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Murteza Mahmoudi. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Radiology and Precision Health Program at Michigan State University. And I'm also a co-founder of the Academic Parity Movement. So, um, I mean, I myself are still learning about like the uh, root causes of academic bullying and academic harassment in general. Um, and I'm uh, the learning basically is through the interaction of the experts in the field, including yourself, Laura Lee, Suzanne, and Nancy. So every story that I hear, every expert that I talk with, I basically learn a new thing about like um, academic bullying. But from my humble point of view, academic bullying means that um, uh, basically a violation of human right in a lab setting or in an academic setting. Uh, if I want to basically expand about like uh, the actions, I would say any unacceptable uh, behaviors or actions that falls out of um, academic freedom, um, including like uh, verbal abuse, violation of uh, uh, authorship, uh, intellectual property and academic credit in general, um, um, doing retaliation when someone basically uh, speak up about their concerns and basically mobbing against them, which is ganging up against the target, threatening over their jobs or their future career, or even like the current situation that they have or the funding that they may get. So those kinds of things, uh, I would consider them as academic bullying because all of them, right, I like I mentioned, is a kind of violation of the human scientific rights. And uh, so uh, to me, it's very interesting that this issue has been going for, I don't know, it's an age old uh, issue. In, in It's not focused in like academic setting, it's everywhere. But here I'm talking like about the issue in academia. I think we, we had faced that from Einstein's time, uh, like when he basically uh, um, introduced kind of his ideas, there's a, like a book published by like over hundred authors that they basically uh, um, ridiculed Einstein's ideas. Uh, and it was not based on the scientific perspective. It's based on the, like the, prejudice, denial, and that sort of like unethical actions to a, to, to a new idea that was proposed basically by, by Einstein. And when uh, people ask uh, uh, from Einstein about like this book, he mentioned that if I were wrong, then one author would have been enough. Why hundred authors? So I think uh, I think it's um, it's basically um, a, a issue of like ganging up against the target, which we had from those days all the way to the recent like uh, story of Eric Lander, like from the White House. So all of them basically clearly shows that we were as an academic and as a building block of the scientific community, we have not been able to address this issue. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, I think at least from my 
like learning uh, through interactions with Loralee. Um, I think um, it's kind of a lack of collaboration between like uh, various stakeholders because institutions who should basically in the first line of addressing academic bullying, they have many things in common with perpetrators. So they may not be in a best position to fairly and unbiasedly basically address academic bullying. And when I'm talking about their interest, it would be their reputation, the funding that a perpetrator may bring in the system, the inaccountability of uh, in internal investigation committees, even for the scandals of academic bullying when they reach to the media, there's no, no mention of who basically investigated academic bullying for like many years. And because some of the perpetrators actually had a great history of doing, doing like uh, bullying and sexual harassment and uh, things like that. And there were basically hundreds of complaints which uh, were ignored by, by institutions. So the, the lack of any statement from investigation, internal investigation committees is, is a concerning issue there. So uh, like I mentioned, institutions have many reasons to basically cover up, but when we have like interactions with funding agencies that they basically promise to like solve the issue and get the funding from a perpetrator, uh, that makes institution in a position that be less supportive of like uh, uh, academic harassers. The other thing is uh, like the lack of awareness in the field. I mean, we have a rich literature about academic bullying. Unfortunately, it only comes from the social sciences or a specific like fields. It seems that other uh, like uh, stakeholders, like journal editors and uh, researchers in other fields are not as much proactive as the social science fields are. So this is one of the problem. When you have a piece in academic bullying and you want to publish it, you get issue, I mean, you, you face issues on, on finding a proper location for that. When you reach any journals, they may say that, oh, it's uh, like out of the scope of our journal. But the reality is that racism, academic bullying, harassment, gender imbalances, they are, they are I would say, uh, science, uh, the general issue of all science, regardless of a specific disciplines. So we have the issue of awareness. We have the issue of, uh, like I mentioned, the lack of uh, integrated functioning against uh, among stakeholders. And the awareness is important because sometimes even perpetrators are supported by public money. This is a shame to our scientific community, but because their interest is kind of intertwined with institutional in, uh, interest, institutional lawyer actually defend the perpetrators, whereas a target needs to basically seek their own like uh, uh, way of help they are basically um, helpless, I would say. They are at the lower uh, power difference, uh, I would say, uh, um, realm. And at the same time, many of those are international students. They are dependent on their visa. There are like cultural and language barriers, lack of like support from friends and families. So this is another basically big uh, issue. The other issue I would say is, is the well-defined issue of uh, retaliation. The people that speak up, they basically get retaliated and they get retaliated in a way that send a positive signals to other perpetrators that uh, they are being safe. They can do whatever they want to do. And the negative and strong signals to, to other targets that the best way is to use code of silence and only tolerate the side effects, whatever it is. And institutions basically, I think, get anything to get rid of the targets, specifically those who basically speak up. So these are basically the major issues that I see in the field. And it's in line with the recent report of the US National uh, Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine, 
where they basically um, mentioned that despite of even having a strong like law enforcement against academic harassment and mandatory educational policies that institutions have, there's little evidence that they see a significant reduction in, in the incidence of like, like uh, academic and sexual harassment. So you can imagine in the lack of uh, strong law in the field of like academic bullying, what, what would be expected from anyone in the field. So I think even in the field of sexual harassment, the lack of uh, collaboration between different stakeholders is very important. Uh, I always think that even decision makers can, can come to the equation and uh, they basically tie institutional reputation to their anti-bullying uh, 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 records. And uh, based on this situation, we basically founded academic parity movement with the hope that we can basically increase awareness in the field and basically uh, make it out of a taboo so everyone basically can talk about these things. And we also provide a platform to empower targets, bring different stakeholders. We basically um, uh, launch uh, like annual conferences that we try to invite different like people from different views, different lenses, so they can also provide their insights and we can basically facilitate the, the talk between different stakeholders. And uh, the last part is that we try to basically have a collective power because many people tries to address the issue, they don't know where to put the efforts. So the academic parity movement, one of the major uh, like aims is to provide that fertile ground that the collective power can, can grow and empower uh, targets. Hi, my name is Lorley Keishley. I'm a professor of communication at Wayne State University in Detroit. Um, and I have been doing work in workplace bullying for research for over about 30 years. Um, and what I wanted, to, and it was about 15 years ago that I figured I should be paying attention to my own organizational context. So that's academia. So for the last several years, I focused my attention, particularly on faculty experiences of bullying. That's how I've had the wonderful opportunity to meet with Morteza Mahmoudi and a number of our other speakers as well as just a lot of people in the academy to talk about that. When you've been doing something as long as I have, it's interesting to look to see what are the things that we're not talking about. So Morteza has really raised that issue within the sciences and how the culture uh, that we have developed in academia can in, inadvertently and sometimes deliberately support these kinds of persistent hostilities directed at people. I have become particularly interested in the last couple of years with the role of electronic communication. And so that's what I wanted to share today with all of you is some of my learnings around the idea about cyberbullying. And I'm gonna focus on faculty because that's the group that I've tended to focus on. And so let me give you a sort of a Reader's Digest condensed version um, about what we know about this. In essence, cyberbullying is about repeatedly being subjected to uh, perceive negative acts uh, through technology. So phone, email, website, social media that are related to people's work context. So we're talking about workplace cyberbullying. Um, and it's in such a situation that the person who's being targeted, person or persons who are being targeted, have difficulty defending themselves. So, uh, and that's, you know, that's a very similar definition to workplace bullying writ large. But right now what we're focusing on is the things that occur through technology. What I find interesting about focusing on, on faculty is that faculty work contexts are essentially boundaryless. Um, faculty work on and off campuses. They work in person on virtual. They do use a variety of media and they engage at multiple audiences, often because of the media that they have. They're extremely exposed as a result because of both the nature, the content of their work, but also the places of their work. So they work everywhere. So in essence, when we talk about cyberbullying of faculty, we're talking about workplace bullying because of the they work in a variety of contexts. They teach online and communicate through electronic means such as email and course management systems. 
Um, faculty info is available on university websites, so it includes their scholarly creative activity, teaching interests, um, and they have increasing presence on social media. Um, social media is seen by a lot of faculty as a way to facilitate the development of professional networks to share their creative and research work and also their current views on social issues. Um, a particular note is the, is the role of social media. And social media is, particularly for me, is a curious one because it really creates the opportunity for cyber mobbing. So now we're not talking one-on-one, -on -one, we're talking a number of people coming after a particular target. And there are two types of those. There's the public opportunistic type. So somebody posts something on social media, faculty member posts a perspective on social media, other people, um, it gets shared beyond their networks to other people, and those folks start jumping on, critiquing, doing whatever they're going to do. The other form, which some might even argue is even more egregious, is the networked coordinated harassment. So this is when you have a third party who is systematically working with their networks to target particular faculty, particular scholars for their research, for the, the specific opinion they reported. So it's a very coordinated kind of effort. Um, so those are, those are very powerful. They happen very fast and they can be very overwhelming. So I like to focus on right now, what universities can be thinking about with respect to that. So universities first need to understand that faculty work and the threats can occur from off site. So I'm appreciative of Morteza's work, my colleague Leah Hollis, and a number of the others who, where a lot of the work on bullying amongst faculty or with faculty or directed at faculty has had to do with institutional insiders or other scholars. I'm particularly interested now in talking about the external actors because with electronic communication comes increased exposure. Now we engage with multiple audiences. So now that's a particular challenge for a university because a university has no direct control over those actors. They may have more control over institutional members, but they do not have control over external actors. So in order for them to address some of these issues, they have to be creative, uh, think outside the box, and that I think is useful for workplace bullying writ large. So, um, there's a particular, so I want to talk about the public writ large. So the external audiences that come in from outside. What's particularly, what can be exciting about sharing your information, your ideas, your perspectives in electronic media is the opportunity to engage with multiple audience. And when it's at its best, it's rich discussion and debate that is very exciting and helps develop the ideas and has us think about things from multiple perspectives. When it's not so great, is when people come after and attack and personalize and undermine and um, and it can escalate to things like physical violence and physical threats. So doxing, for example, is where personal information about, say, for example, faculty member, <clears throat> excuse me, is posted online and people are encouraged uh, to pursue them, to engage with them. Now, most of the research on, as I mentioned before, on workplace bullying and cyber bullying in faculty is done internally. And most of that, and so kind of the general rates, because I know people like to know just how big a problem is this. So about in um, Wanda Cassidy and her colleagues out of Simon Fraser University have been doing a phenomenal amount of work on this. And they report that about 12% of faculty will report that this comes, cyberbullying comes from their colleagues, and about 15% comes from students. Now, most of the research on cyberbullying of faculty focuses on students doing things to faculty, less so having to do with the public. So these kinds of attacks include things like personal attacks, threats, and often demands for the institution to control or to remove the offending faculty member. Um, these can become even more dire for a faculty member when an institution fails to respond or does so inadequately. And often what institutions will do is kind of tell the faculty member, can you just get off social media for a while? Could you use different kinds of language? Could you maybe even consider refocusing your research? right, which is putting responsibility on a faculty member for the behavior and the actions of other actors. 
universities are in tough spots when it's the public because of the importance of their own institutional reputation and survival. And the public can include a number of different types of actors. It can include the government, the state, it can include funders, it can include donors, it can include a number that are critical to a university's survival, right? And unlike institutional employees, universities don't have direct control over these folks. So that makes it particularly challenging. So what do they need to be thinking about? Well, they need to recognize, universities need to recognize that they have, they must be able to defend academic freedom and the right to free inquiry. And they need to recognize that faculty work occurs off outside outside of campus, off campus. Therefore, academic freedom extends to faculty wherever they are doing their work and when it's grounded in the kind of work that they do. So they need to recognize that. They need to make explicit support and explicitly support. So not just implicitly saying to faculty member, we're behind you, making explicit statements about supporting faculty um, academic freedom and right to inquiry and visibly taking action to defend and support faculty when they are targeted for their work and expertise. Um, one of the things we wanna be really cautious of is to the extent that faculty aren't protected from this, that uh, in, un, universities are not able or are not taking some of the responsibility to at least try to support and buffer faculty from this is that faculty are at risk of doing self-censorship, which means some of the really important challenging ideas that we need as a vibrant democracy to be engaging with start to disappear. And so we run the risk of conformity, um, loss of critical information. So universities can do policies, um, which we typically do, and they do have a place and they are important. Uh, but recent reviews of current violence and harassment policies on university campuses show that most of them don't pay attention to cyber attacks. Um, now, there are such things as information technology policies and social media policies. So those are very explicitly about electronic communication. So we feel good about those. But as you read those, you realize their limitations. So information technology policies are about institutional tech the kinds of tech that a university controls. So if somebody is using a university sanctioned mechanism, there are options a university immediately has. They can remove that person from having access. They can hold them accountable in a number of different ways. But many of these external actors are not using this. All right, so that's, that's one limitation. Social media policies. If you look at some of the social media policies, many of them are focused on basically how faculty should be present in social media, and in particular, how they should position themselves relative to the institution. So it's often more about an institution's representation. Don't claim you're a part of this if you're expressing a personal opinion, you know, but it's not really about what are we gonna do if I get attacked? What are we going to do and how are we gonna respond? What's exciting is that universities are responding. And a really cool example of that is the University of Iowa who a few years back uh, developed a, um, a set of programming and documents and policies under faculty support and safety guidance. Wonderful resources. I will share those with Linda so that they can be available to you. Um, that's really important. And in fact, a number of major universities in the States have used those, have used the Universities of Iowa's template and ways of thinking to provide that kind of support. Um, if they're incredibly detailed, they talk about everybody's roles and responsibilities, how be people become aware of what's happening, faculty member notifying, but also universities are monitoring social media sites, websites, all other forms of electronic communication so they can get on fast. Because as you know, these things blossom and they go like that. And the university needs to be responded fast. So we need protocols and we need policies. And there are wonderful examples. And the University of Iowa is one of them. Um, another thing that universities and folks can do is to share experiences and we're going to, uh, you know, from people who have been targeted, whether that's institution to institution, right, who have an institution that has dealt with having a faculty member targeted in fairly vicious social media maelstroms where faculty have been threatened and how they responded, they can share that learning experience with other institutions, 
uh, or faculty member to faculty member. Uh, PEN America, for example, has sponsored uh, panels of faculty who have been targeted by cyberbullying and mobbing, and they talk about the experience they've had, what their institution did, and ways to help you as individuals prepare for that. What's missing in a lot of this conversation is how to hold these actors accountable. So the support and the buffering is really critical and universities are still struggling with how to hold actors accountable. Now there are legal possibilities they could use, but those usually will rely on the target, the actors having done things that violate federal or state regulations. So there are some examples of that. Uh, but that's not. So what does that mean? <laughs> it means we want as much as possible to prevent this from becoming an issue. So we need to build institutional members' awareness, their knowledge and skill. So I notice I said institutional members, not just faculty, but everybody within the institution, their skills, their knowledge to thoughtfully and actively manage and control their digital presence and engagement with diverse audiences. Notice what I'm saying here. I'm not saying you shouldn't be present or you should only be present in certain ways. You need to think about what you want to do, what your purposes of doing it, what are some of the best platforms to do that, what audiences are you going to engage. One of the things research has revealed is that faculty are quite active um, in these electronic environments often are not aware or don't fully appreciate that they're not just speaking to one audience, they're speaking to multiple audiences. And that's not to say they shouldn't be saying what they say, but they need to think about what these other audiences, how they perceive things, how they do things. And also there are some platforms that are better for public discourse and engagement than other platforms. Twitter may not be the one that's really good for having a lively critical discussion and debate in 256 characters. Um, so we, tr part of it is for all institutional members learning about digital privacy and security, there are some wonderful resources available to people that we can do individually, but also institutions, how to use digital communication and your literacy of that. Um, to understand the nature and structure of various platforms and audiences and how to shape and how that shapes communication. Therefore, how I, as a faculty member, with that knowledge and experience, can shape my message in a way to get to audiences so that they can hear the nuggets of what I'm getting at and not be reacting to something else that really is a distraction from the key message. And that requires faculty to be really clear about what they're posting and why they're posting it and what they want to achieve. I think the other, this is my last point, I think the other things that universities can be doing, but also faculty at the same time, is taking initiative. So that's about educating and engaging the public. So rather than always being reactive, although we're always going to need to be able to do that, we're going to need to have protocols when a faculty member is attacked, we're going to need to have all of that. We need to be out there and be proactive in setting the tone and focus of conversation. So educating our own institutional members and the public about what universities are, what faculty do, and why they need to be allowed to do it. So that includes conversation about what is academic freedom? What is civil debate and dialogue? And how do you do that? How do you respond to somebody you disagree with? What is critical thinking? What don't you know? What do you know and how you know? I mean, we do this in our classrooms. We should be doing this and engaging the public in very constructive ways and doing that proactively, not, as a, not always just in response to because somebody got hit, but because we see an opportunity here, critique and dissent, and the costs of things like public shaming, deplatforming, and silencing to a vibrant democracy. Thank you. Um, so, hi, this is Susanne Teuber. I'm a social psychologist working in uh, the Netherlands at the University of Groningen. And I have both witnessed and experienced bullying and power abuse. Uh, and so, like Laura Lee and Morteza, over the past years, I have started to look into academic bullying uh, specifically. And uh, one of the things I find uh, fascinating is that many people are quite flabbergasted when they realize the sheer scale of power abuse and bullying that is taking place in academia, 
because it just doesn't rhyme with this public image that we have of universities as spaces of civilized collaboration, where those with the best credentials and the best performance get promoted. Whereas, in fact, uh, bullying is actually uh, almost built into the academic system uh, and is absolutely not incidental. Um, and that has everything to do, I guess, with the academic uh, um, organization, how we have organized academia and higher education, which is very competitive, um, made up of quite steep hierarchies that are invisible often because we tend as academics to pretend that we are all equal and the same. Um, and there's also, uh, of course, oftentimes a lack of proper funding involved, which uh, just fuels this competitiveness. So basically what researchers uh, find over the past years more and more is that um, higher education seems to offer a survival benefit in particular to bullies because those colleagues who are willing to bully others and abuse their power over them, for instance, by claiming authorships or data or research resources, are simply more likely to survive uh, in academia and climb the organizational ladder. And so because it is an environment that seems to incentivize bullies so much, it is actually not so surprising that academia is experienced as unsafe and even violent, especially by people who belong to multiply minoritized and underrepresented groups. Huh? And who that is, of course, can change by context. So it's very important also that um, groups like the academic parity movement and researchers quite generally uh, also take into account contextual factors because we can learn a lot from them, of course. But so, as uh, Morteza already mentioned, and also Laura Lee, yeah, um, of course, the institution is reacting to uh, things that we as researchers, as faculty, and also students say. And we have seen many policies and procedures being uh, installed and implemented over the past years. So we will probably find, for instance, that most universities have a zero tolerance policy against bullying. Uh, or a code of conduct to safeguard scientific integrity. Um, oftentimes they will also now have quite sophisticated complaint procedures on paper, uh, confidential advisors, and sometimes also ombudspersons. They have just become uh, mandatory in the Netherlands for each university to have an ombudsperson. Uh, they have been um, uh, uh, compulsory in Germany for a long time. And my German colleagues always uh, have a lot of anecdotes about um, how well these uh, ombuds uh, persons function as, uh, you know, as a function of how they are implemented in the university that you are looking at. So one of the things that we see is um, paradoxically that some of these measures seem to make things worse when it comes to academic bullying. So what I have done over the past years, also uh, in my role as advisor for the academic parity movement, but also as advisor for the German network against power abuse in science, is I've been talking to dozens of uh, colleagues, students, um, people, young colleagues, older colleagues, you know, senior faculty, junior faculty, people on fixed term contracts, people with tenure. And what I actually come across again and again and again is that people who are trying to report bullying, harassment or power abuse um, are confronted with retaliation. So exactly what Morteza already mentioned, um, it simply means that these zero tolerance policies in the first place do not work adequately because people are encountering bullying, but then also that the complaint procedures uh, fail to work adequately. Um, for instance, what we often hear is that perpetrators um, are actually having a lot of support from people within the organization. So uh, a common uh, knowledge is, for instance, by now um, that HR advisors are often siding with the bullies simply because the bullies have a higher status than their targets and HR feel more sort of connected with management than with the people at the lower end of the hierarchy. 
So one of the most traumatizing experiences that we are being told of uh, by uh, targets of bullying is uh, being gaslighted, right? A tactic used to make targets of bullying doubt their own reality. So what we hear often is that the bullies and there are many organizational enablers will tell uh, someone who tries to report about bullying or discrimination or harassment that they are reacting overly sensitively, that they are hysterical, that they lack a sense of humor, or that they do not understand the organizational culture. And then if the reporter insists on pulling through with their complaint, they will be met with what scientists describe as normative violence. So they will be framed as troublemakers, as lacking communication skills, and then they end up being forced into coaching and mediation. And um, so what, what we actually see is that many people are so surprised by the warped reality that the bully and their enablers project on them that they start to quite intuitively think that these people did not really understand the pain they have caused. So many targets will start to write letters explaining what happened again in detail in an attempt to sort of explain themselves better, assuming that the other did not understand that. So this is one piece of very concrete advice I have for, for people in the academy um, who are experiencing gaslighting is just don't waste your energy on writing letters to your bully and their enablers. So one piece of advice that we often give with the academic parity movement and Morteza has also written about that is document what happens to you and you should definitely document what happens to you. But be aware that bullies know that they are wrong and you are right and bullying is really about power disbalances. So if you have complained about a bully, what you're actually challenging is the power differential. And that means the bully is usually not lacking awareness, but they are asserting their power. Um, and also what we hear many times now, because people become more uh, articulate about uh, stuff they are not agreeing with. Uh, this is part of you know, raising awareness. So I do see that we are making a difference over time. But uh, for instance, one of the things we encounter often is that university lawyers are quite well aware of this letter writing reflex and they will often use it against you. So they will write some unfounded claims about you and then they can just you know, sit back and wait for your puzzled and enraged response. And then they will say, oh, see, that person has a conflict. This is not a reasonable person. This is such an inappropriate letter and so on. So basically you end up doing their work for them and so what I'm trying to say is document everything that is happening to you if you're being bullied, but if you can avoid it at all, just don't write letters. Use your energy for self-care and for finding support. So basically in light of all of this, I feel uh, truly that one of the greatest achievements we have made with groups such as the Academic Parity Movement and also the Network Against Power Abuse and Science in Germany is that we educate targets of bullying about these tactics. And what we often see is that people who have been gaslighted for a long time, because typically these, uh, uh, these encounters take a long time. It's not like a one week encounter, but something that drags on for years sometimes. What we find is that people are incredibly grateful when they hear that this is not all in their minds, that they are not crazy, and that they are certainly not alone with their experiences. So what we do is we offer individual counseling and advice to help targets of bullying and power abuse to survive and ideally to come out stronger. Uh, because what we will hear in, in a couple of minutes from Nancy, there are immense sacrifices one has to accept for doing the right thing. And we actually believe that nobody should have to walk this route alone. So after all, and I'm fully uh, uh, on one page with Morteza on that, I think a higher education system in which only the bullies survive means that public money is misused to keep people in power who constantly undermine quality and innovation in research and education and who undermine their colleagues' human dignity. And really nobody should accept that.
my name is Nancy Oliveria and I'm a professor of pediatrics medicine and public health sciences at the University of Toronto. I am uh, not, you'll notice, in any way a researcher in bullying, by contrast to my colleagues on this panel. I'm not an expert, but I am an expert witness as a survivor of a long story of whistleblowing and academic research. And of course, with whistleblowing comes retaliation, harassment, bullying, and power abuse. And that, of course, is what we're talking about today. I actually don't know a longer whistleblower story than my story, and it's still ongoing, and I won't have time to relate that, but I will try to give you the Coles Notes version and the aspects of bullying that I encountered <clears throat> in my story and what, if anything, I learned from that. Um, I think it's important to tell stories um, because, as Suzanne indicated, uh, you're usually met with disbelief, as in the common theme, like, did this happen? I'm writing a book about my experience, and uh, I have to laugh when people who are not in academia cannot believe that this has actually gone on. And again, it's a story with some unique elements, but it is not an uncommon one. It's a story of academic collusion and cover-up of research and professional misconduct, conflicts of interest, collaborators, as Suzanne alluded, who are more equal than others, academic harassment and bullying, and the clear cost of doing the right thing. Okay, so back in 1996, in another era, I was um, a youngish professor of pediatrics and medicine. I'd just been obtained a five-year Medical Research Council Scientist Award. I'd just been pr promoted to professor, elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation, and I ran the largest program of um, hematology oncology at the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, that in thalassemia and sickle cell disease, and was involved in an active research program funded by federal funds and in international work. And I tell you this because I was not a junior um, person. I was not really that junior. I'd been 10 years employed there. I had um, uh, a track record and I had some strong international supporters who were critical in my story. I'm not sure I can get into that in, in, in detail, but um, in any way I was conducting a trial and that was for kids in thalassemia and I identified inadequate effectiveness and later toxicity of this new drug. And I reported that to the research ethics board at the instruction of the chair of the board. And four days later, the company that was partly funding the trial sent me a letter saying, if you choose to publish or divulge that information, you will be subject to all legal remedies. I immediately unusually got legal counsel from the Medical Protective Association. I don't know anyone before or since who got that counsel, and that was part of my protection the next, for the next year. Um, but what was um, a problem was when I officially appealed to the chairman of pediatrics, the chair of medicine, the director of the research institute, the dean, the provost, and the widespread ethics community, um, I was met with both harassment, silence and harassment, and um, the hospital and the university uh, did actually more than silence. Um, and I'll, I'll clarify right up front that at the time, the CEO of the pharmaceutical company that was partly funding the research had been in discussion with the university for the largest donation to the university in its history, with much of that to go to the affiliated teaching hospitals. And some were led to speculate that this was at the root of the problem that some that developed later, which is the following. Over that period, almost immediately, both institutions undertook a bullying campaign to accuse me of sloppiness, incompetence in my research and research misconduct. The hospital executive publicly circulated allegations made by the drug company CEO against the quality of my work. My students were harassed and marginalized. My research fellows were evicted and their emails, pagers and phone lines were cut. There was delay in the approval of my ongoing research proposals, finally removal of my research space and closed closure of my lab. And that was on the research side of things and it was remarkably effective. On the clinical side of things, there were private interviews with students, nurses and fellows who worked with me a patient was actually encouraged actively to sue me for something that was um, uh, completely vexatious and, and that came to nothing. There were successive removals from my directorship of the program almost every year in 1996 and 1998 and 1999. And there was an erosion of resources for my patients. 
And as far as the personal aspects of bullying, there was a whisper campaign alleging medical errors and that I had been stealing money from my grants. All this, I uh, will tell you, came to nothing, but I was certainly shunned at work um, by systematic um, organization by coworkers. There were a few colleagues I'll tell you about in a minute, and our private emails were published on the front page of the um, newly minted um, most right-wing press. There were documents about me circulated to the Ontario Hospital Association by mistake. And finally, the 12 clinical chiefs of the hospital voted to remove me. And there was an uh, internal um, committee set up to review the conduct of what had happened. Unsurprisingly, this is an internal review, the hospital's appointed committee found that I was blameworthy, claiming that I had undertaken unauthorized research this resulted in further empowerment of the mobbers, imposition of gag orders on my supporters, more financial and academic sanctions, libel in the international press, allegations of research misconduct on my part, which was referred to the university's highest investigative committee, and I was sent to the College of Physicians and Surgeons in an attempt to remove my medical license, <clears throat> and then fired. Um, so this, um, then what followed was a series of dramatic, um, anonymous, racist, harassing hate mail letters. Um, the authorship was denied by the author who was arguably the most powerful physician at the hospital. And his authorship was identified only after my colleagues identified DNA proof from a stamp he was known to have licked and sent it to a DNA lab in California to compare it to the DNA on the anonymous letters. <clears throat> This was, um, as you might imagine, highlighted quite a bit in the medical and lay press at the time. Uh, John Le Carre wrote a book about it called The Constant Gardener. It was highlighted on 60 Minutes and much of the other um, American press and the, uh, the Canadian press. The hate mailer wasn't content with this kind of professional misconduct. He took my data, appropriated it, and altered my work. We struggled, my lawyers and the faculty association and I, to hold him accountable for research misconduct. There was no punishment despite the finding that he had committed research misconduct and the retraction of that paper occurred only 17 years later. That was highlighted in Retraction Watch not so long ago. Then as these things go came a series of settlements. Um, and they settled because I think what you have to understand when you're being harassed is that at the time you least feel like doing so, you must engage um, help. You must engage people who are like-minded. There aren't going to be many, but you will find there are a few. And you must engage lawyers. I've had people who know it all say, oh, I would never engage lawyers because they somehow feel that that is a tainted approach. But let me tell you, the universities and the hospitals are engaging lawyers full time. Those lawyers are sitting in every meeting in which they are planning your harassment, bullying, and power abuse. So you have to fight back. So um, that is a very, very quick summary of my <clears throat> story. And um, I am not sure, not being a researcher, that this doesn't parallel almost every story. But I do know that I don't remember this quote, where this quote comes from, but I always laugh at it. If you have God, the facts, the law, and the press on your side, you have a 50-50 chance of defeating the bureaucracy. I wish I knew where that came from, but I would recommend a book called <clears throat> Broken Lives and Organizational Power by C. Fred Alford, published about 20 years ago, who kind of nails it there. It's, um, it's everything you want to know about harassment, bullying, and um, including but not limited people who actually whistleblow in academic settings. So I guess what I would say as an expert witness to all of this was that I learned some philosophical and practical points. Um, philosophically, sort of in harassment and bullying and in life, once you challenge the system, you really actually don't have a choice but not to back down because a grenade has gone off in your life and you will lose the life you had as you knew it. As Suzanne has alluded, you will spend more time in correspondence than you could have believed. You'll count lawyers as your friends. You'll become familiar with terms like reasonable apprehension of bias. And you'll be familiar with all the aspects of arbitrations, hearings, and lawsuits if you don't back down. If you do back down, you'll be fired. And you have to be able to engage the law. I had 27 lawyers. 
Um, and I ha have to say that they were not defense lawyers all the time. They were lawyers I engaged, including to issue many libel lawsuits, including um, all of them were successfully settled, I wanna say. Just to update you on the college referral to which I was referred to the college for an attempt to lose my license, the college wrote back and said, no, I think that she acted commendably. And um, somewhat surprisingly, the institutions did not appeal that decision. So I still have my license, my medical license, and I'm still here, but it was quite a fight. And the practical, um, the practical lessons I learned were these, as I've already said 50 times, use lawyers, use the faculty association, sometimes you're lucky. I was phenomenally lucky. The University of Toronto Faculty Association and the Canadian Association of University Teachers were unusually engaged in this fight for a very long time. They're in their 26th year of supporting us because the ongoing, the, the situation is still actively ongoing. I can't say too many good things about faculty associations. They're, they're of course dependent on their leaders, but we were lucky. There are people to help you. They're just never gonna be the ones you would expect. You'll lose most of your friends because most of them don't wanna really care about this. And if they don't know or don't care about what's taken over your life, you'll become probably pretty enraged at them. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear what Suzanne said about not writing letters. Um, I, I think some of the letters in my case did save me, but they were written by my supporters, I might add, not by me. And speaking of supporters, never go to a meeting without one. If you have to take your dog to the meeting as a witness, you need to do that. Never go alone. Use the press. It's very much harder now that they're so co-opted and so thin on the ground. As far as ombuds people, I found that experience to be extremely disappointing. Um, don't even want to mention human resources because they're just not your friend as an harasser. And I think you need to find loyalists. And if you can't do it with the supporters, you're not going to survive. So you need to search them out. Uh, that's my story and my experience. As you can see, an incredible amount of information has been shared here today. Facts, research, resources, tips, suggestions, solutions, and even the, the hard reality of what many are experiencing in academia. This is a very serious topic. It's impacting the lives of many. As a person who I have experienced it myself, but I've been in running the Canadian Institute of Workplace Bullying and Harassment for almost 12 years now. And I have those people who are injured coming to see me, deans, instructors, students with horrific stories. Mm -hmm. Nothing shocks me anymore after all these stories that I've heard but I agree with everything that any all of these speakers have said, 100%. You need more information, you need awareness built, you need training needs to be mandatory. And I'm and I'm happy to hear Suzanne say that you know there's there's treatment available for people in your area. I'm out there training therapists on this injury because it's slightly different than other injuries. It's a slightly different trauma. A lot of us call it a trauma of betrayal and betrayal by institutions, internal and external institutional betrayal. And it cuts to the core. As some people say it, it it's like to, right to my very soul. And we're looking at people who are threatened by their, their sponsorship taken away, their career, their credibility, years of hard work, and they feel trapped and stuck. And I hope after hearing this today, that you're going to know that you're not alone that you can reach out to any one of us, that there are answers and solutions and support available, even when there, you're, there aren't solutions yet. Um, I agree, if it's a gaslighting situation, don't bother writing because nobody, they're not gonna listen to you if they're gaslighting. That's, a, in my opinion, psychological violence. I agree with Nancy that there are times when writing is very, very important and standing up and fighting and not giving up. And I have known many who have lost their homes, lost their marriages, lost, lost so much as a result of psychological harassment and psychological violence. I want to thank my guests from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for shining the light on this topic. And we're not going away. We're not going to be silenced.
please share your research papers. Look on the website where this video will be, and all of our guests' research papers will be listed there and resources. And just know that things are changing. Maybe it's slow, but things are changing. This is not going away. There, it is going to be better for our grandchildren, and we're just going to keep fighting for it. So thank you. This episode was brought to you by the Canadian Institute of Workplace Harassment and Violence, providing consulting, coaching, mentoring, and training for the prevention, intervention, repair, and recovery of workplace bullying and harassment. You can reach us on our website at workplaceharassment.ca.